Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're fun. <laughs> this morning I, I come and I, I coming with a word that actually, and Ken I think announced it last week, it came over the summer and it came at a very, very interesting time. You guys that were here last year in school realized that we kind of limped our way through the spring and kind of a little bit virtual and doing online and everything else and the Lord was very, very gracious. And school ended, and of course, there's a lot of questions, you know, at that time, you know, what's the fall going to be like? How are we going to start up? And sermons get birthed in very unique ways. Um, any of you that will speak a lot, and even if you get into homiletics class and so forth, you'll realize that some of your sermons will be birthed out of your devotional life. Some of your sermons will be birthed out of a worship time like today. Uh, Everybody is singing a song, and God's just talking to your heart. And you'll find that in those unique situations now, the voice of the Lord becomes very clear. This summer was one of those times. It's very unusual. I mean, there's times that you're looking for a word from the Lord. It's it's planned and everything else. And then there's times when it's unexpected. And the the setting this summer, I just want to set the stage a little bit. I was doing some preparation for Prime this summer, and I was doing a a couple of the sessions for Prime. This one was particularly special to me because I have an interest in science and biology and so forth. That that was my interest in school, headed for the medical field and so forth. And and so as I started reading a lot of literature on just evolution and just the things that are used, the arguments in favor of it and some of the new things going on, I was reading one day and the Lord just began to talk with me. And he said in my heart, he says, do you really see what you're reading at this point? Do you understand the implications of what you're reading? And I said, yeah, I'm going to go teach a, a class on evolution and creation. He says, no, there's ramifications here that go beyond evolution and, and creation. And so out of some study, the Lord began to speak in there. And it was a, a powerful moment for me because when you study for a purpose, like I had a class, I had a specific goal, some educational goals in mind that I wanted to accomplish with the session. And one of them was just to refute some of the ideas and the philosophical things that were presented now in biology class, because the purpose for Prime is to get our high school students ready for college and get them ready for biology 101, where the teacher is basically going to say, you're just mammals and you're freaks and you're accidents. But how do we get our young people to be able to stand against that barrage and really inside not be motivated by those, but be motivated by the words of the Lord that says, you're not just a mammal and you're not an accident, you're not a freak. Because it's going to be that inner stability now. It's going to be that different worldview other than the naturalist, materialist point of view. It's going to be a different worldview that's going to, it's going to take that to counteract just the barrage of stuff that's coming. And I was studying through one of this, uh, and uh, any of you that are apologists, I know some of you like apologetics and so forth, and apologists are great. I like them, you know. Uh, but apologists have an interesting thing because apologists are usually trying to correct wrong things, and so they're deliberately always looking for bad things. They're looking for things that they can attack. You know, they're looking for ideas that are wrong. And rightly so, but it, you can almost get in a defensive mode after a while that you miss some things that you run across and that are really God talking, but yet you just reject it because somebody who wasn't in church didn't say it. And I ran across one of these things and it began to germinate in my heart because I was looking all over and I was studying a lot of the, the writings of uh, Charles Darwin and some of his stuff that he came up with. And Charles Darwin hit the world with a premise and it's something he was trying to prove in all of his investigations and everything else. And that is this, and this is Darwinian evolution. He says this, change occurs in nature through random accidents with no direction from a deity. Hear that again. Changes take place now as random accidents in nature with no direction of a deity. 
And where he got off track was when he put that last little phrase in there, with no input or direction of the deity. Because the truth is this, changes happen in life, but not because of accidents. They happen in life, and what we're gonna find is this, people will learn to change in those situations because of a God-given design, not because of a random accident. And we begin to look at this, and I begin to understand now that sometimes we throw out the baby with the bathwater, and so we throw out Darwinianism and say, well, you know, we don't change in whatever at all. But the Lord says, yes, they do. My kids will change. They're going to start as I go to and they're going to go to an embryo, and they're going to go to a fetus, and then they're going to go to an infant, and they're going to grow to an adolescent, they're going to grow to a young adult, and then they become an old geezer, all right? Life is constantly changing. We're designed for it. God actually built that into us. It's one of the divine mechanisms so that we don't stay babies forever. And in looking at this now, God began just to talk with me because I found this. Darwin observed a fact, but he explained it wrongly. He observed a fact, and that is things do change. Of course, he called them mutations. He called them accidents and everything else. But things do change. And he tried to explain it in his natural mind. He actually tried to explain it in rebellion to God because he was running from God at the time he came up with the theory. He was mad at God because he lost a daughter and he was bitter that, you know, that would touch his family. But Charles Darwin originally went to school to become a clergyman. But what happens to people's hearts that can hit them so that their love and appreciation for God can go the wrong direction? And that's what happened to Darwin. But just a few years later, after he published Now the Origin of the Species, another man published a work. His name is Gregor Mendel. And if you didn't pay attention back in science class, Mendel is the father of modern day genetics. He's the guy who discovered genes and chromosomes. He's the guy that said that things can pass on hereditarily from one to another. It's not an accident, it's not a mutation, it's part of a design. And what makes Mendel so significant is this. He was a monk. He was an Augustinian monk. And he went into science and genetics to do just the opposite of Darwin. Darwin was trying to tell the world that changes come without God, and Mendel went into it to say, no, this is part of the design of an almighty God. And it's amazing how the motivation can touch two different people, and they can come up with such great different conclusions. But as we look at this area of genetics and come down, it brings us to where we're at today, because when we look at the area of genetics, and so forth, what we're seeing in genetics is this. There is an ability within all of us to experience changes in our environment around us, and what has been designed into us is the ability to adapt, the ability to change. We can't always control the circumstances that are out there, but what we can control is our responses to them. And sometimes when people look at, you know, what's going on around us, they say, Lord, how in the world do we relate to it? And God says, do you not realize the miracle that I've done for you? I have built into your genetic code the ability to change. Because if you couldn't, it would be hopeless. We would face all these challenges and we would hit a brick wall and say we could go no further. But the fact that I've put something in the heart of each one of you that says, there are certain things that don't have to stay the same, and let me show you how they're going to change, it gives hope. It gives hope to each one of us, especially as we face this. And, and Charles Darwin came up with uh, a saying, and it goes back to his natural selection, and that is the survival of the fittest. And I'm not going to buy into that totally, but what I will say is this. There is an important element of our life to be survivors to face the challenges that we do and find the way that we can. And I won't use Darwin's term, I'll use a biblical term. So that we can face the things in life and be overcomers. 
Not just surviving, because surviving bears a connotation of just hanging on and hope that you outlast the situation. And that's the way some people are at today. They're looking at all the changes taking place, and they say, I'm just going to curl up in a cocoon and see if I can outlast us, and then eventually it'll get back to normal. But maybe it won't get back to normal. Maybe it now will go on, and God says, let's change. And he wants to give to us some direction here, and this is what I want to touch on today a little bit, because the Christian walk is about change. I mean, look at some of the initial statements. We go into the Gospels, and Jesus told people, you need to repent and be converted. There's got to be some changing going on here. And if you do, you're going to become a new creation. You're going to put on a new man. And if you hang in here till the end, you're going to be part of a new heaven and a new earth. Things are going to change. And he begins to lay out for us a beautiful picture of, of what's coming in the future. And so when we came this fall, and that's where this word originated, I was really asking the Lord this summer, what do we need to have in our souls to help us face all the changes we're seeing around here? How do we handle this? And he began to speak to me, and he began to share some things, and I'd like to share them with you. Romans chapter 8, and I'd like you to just turn there, because I'm actually, these are the bookends. I'm going to start the message with Romans 8, 28, and I'm going to end it with Romans 8, 29. Romans 8 is such a crucial chapter because it describes now, really, Paul's eschatology. He's going to talk about, you know, the creation's going to be renewed. He talks about us being renewed. He talks about now the spirit of adoption that's going to take us in. We're going to become glorified. We're going to be in the presence of God. He brings everything now to its logical conclusion. But as he paints this amazing picture of the future, then he goes back and says this. But I'm convinced that before that day comes, there are certain things that may try, but they can never separate you from the love of God. And they may seem formidable, but let me tell you this, God's bigger than those things. And so in Romans 8, 28, and this is a scripture I'll start with today, he says this, for we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We read that, we hear that, we probably memorized it at times too, but the all things that work together includes COVID, it includes wildfires that give us a rating, an air particle rating over 500. It talks about potential economic collapse. It talks about 100 nights of rioting in the street. It talks about the potential chaos that the next election is going to bring. That's part of the all things. Those things are not outside the realm of what God can do to work things together for what? A purpose. A purpose. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. There is a, a cooperative effort that goes on there. And I think it's very important that we see the nature of this cooperative effort. So I've got a few slides. And we're going to throw them up. I, hopefully they'll come up up there. And these are just some things I want to walk you through as we go through. Just some simple points. The first one is this. God has a plan for your life before you do. He has a tremendous plan for your life before you do. And if they don't come up with, there we are. I'd like to take you to a famous passage here. Psalms 139. If you've got your Bibles, open it up with me. We use Psalms 139 when we're preaching messages on the sanctity of life. Uh, we use Psalms 139 when we're fighting abortion and so forth. But I'd like to use Psalms 139 today as the heart of an individual that stands before the Lord being transparent and he's fully aware of all that God knows about him and all that God has planned. And he starts in verse one, it says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from far away. My words, verse four, before my word is in my mouth, you know all about them. This guy's fully aware of something and that is God has a very intimate understanding of him. That even in the middle of his circumstance, God is aware of his words and his actions and his thoughts before they ever take place. And I think that's really important. 
Because we need to not just focus on what's going on around us. We need to see behind that to one who's really controlling what's going on. And he goes on down there and he says, if I, where can I escape you? He basically says, I can't get away from you. God says, good. That's a good thought. All right. So when you're out past curfew, you realize I'm with you at this point. All right. And he says, I can't escape. When I go to heaven, you're there. If I go to Sheol, you're there, and so forth. And then verse 12, even in the darkness, the darkness is not dark to you. It may be dark to other people, and I may be able to hide it from other people, but I can't hide it from you. He says, for it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together now in my mother's womb. And I will praise you in verse 14. And this is the verse. I will praise you for this reason. I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. This person now, as he is thinking about God and God's intimate involvement in his life, is aware of this. You made me fearfully and wonderfully. And even though I may look around and see circumstances and so forth, I can never lose sight of the fact of what you've made me the intricate work of God in my life. Look at some of the scriptures I've got up here, Jeremiah 1.5. God talks to Jeremiah and says, before you were born, when you were in your mother's womb, I appointed you, I chose you. I had a plan for your life. I knew about you better than you did. You see there in Jeremiah 29, famous passage that people love to quote. God comes down and says, I, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for well-being and not for disaster. And my plan is to do this, to give you a future and a hope. Lord, do you know what's going on? Yeah, I know what's going on. But there's a future past this. And there's a hope past this. And I know my thoughts towards you. The last one there in Ephesians chapter 1, this is the words of Paul, and he says this, I know, I know that I was chosen by God. I was predestined now to do his will. And all of this way back there, these are the eternal purposes of God in Galatians 1.15. He says this, I was set apart before I was even born. Can I trust my life with a person that knew me intimately before I was born? Now, look at the next slide here. This is just a, a beautiful picture of, of in the Bible as we look at some people. The seven people or the, yeah, that you're going to see listed there, are all people who were named before they were born. These are people in the Bible that when a woman became pregnant or so forth, the Lord or an angel came and said, oh, you're going to call his name John, which means what? Before these people ever came out, before they ever lived and so forth, God identified them so much that he already gave them a name. He knew them. He knew them intimately, and he's actually going to describe the things that they're going to do in their life as they're born and so forth. And you look at some of these guys in there, and, and some of them were good, some of them were bad and so forth, but you look at them and, and God says this, I know my people, I know what makes them tick, I know how they're made up and so forth, but I know them well enough to know what I can still do with them. We also go down and we, we look in other places in the Bible, like in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 12, when Jeremiah was given this amazing word about his birth, God then follows it up with this. And he says, I want you to know that I watch over my word to perform it. And just like I told you, I picked you before birth. I'm also going to watch over that word to make sure it comes to pass. I know that it's going to be tough and there's going to be things come against you and so forth. But realize this, my word never returns void. I don't say it unless I know I can keep it. And God speaks over their life, and he gives them amazing identities that are out there. Our identities are in God, too. He's called us as unique individuals. He's called us into a corporate body, but so beautiful are we there. And our next slide we see is this. God's calling involves one very important step. It involves you being here. The wisdom of God involves you being here. Your time at PBC is a piece in the mosaic of God's overall picture for your life. And you may think, well, I came here because I was just getting away from something. Well, you may have come here for those reasons. God brought you here for another reason. Because there's all kinds of different goals and plans. 
Your pastor may have had a plan for you. He wants you to grow up at PBC so he can use you when you get back home. Your parents had a plan. Get out of the house, you know. And so you go through and you begin to realize everybody has a plan. You may have had a plan, but ultimately God had a plan. And God says, I want you here for a certain amount of time because there's going to be something that's going to change in your life that's going to be essential down there. You saw pictures of two guys that were here. They came here as students having no understanding of where eventually that would take them, but God said, I have you here for a reason. And God began to blow on their lives and move them. And so this is just part of your journey here. And God is going to do some amazing things, and we get the privilege of watching that unfold. We look down here, and our goals in college, and we come for all kinds of different reasons. Sometimes you come to learn information about God and the Bible. That's good. But realize this. That's not the only goal of coming to PBC. Information alone is not going to change everything. Some of us are coming for just a deeper relationship. It's like Job. I'd heard about him, but maybe I come here and now I learn to know him. I spend a little time in the prayer center. I develop some, some disciplines in life. And guess what? I'm actually talking to him now. I didn't used to. And maybe I learn about ministry and gifting before I saw what ministry was, but then I sit under different ministers and realize it can be done differently than maybe what I've seen before. I expand a little bit. And you'll see that in the difference between your teachers, you know, between Ken and Travis and I and Glenda and so forth. We're all different, and you can learn under each of those. You learn now about yourself, or you're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to learn when you want to run, and you're going to learn when you're going to stay, and you're going to learn what to do when you don't want to do your homework, all right? And, uh, you know, you're going to have the devil on one shoulder, and God's going to be on the other, and so forth. It's going to be there, and the devil's going to say, Netflix, 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 you know, and God's going to say, he says, Bible research, hermeneutic, you know, it's, it's just the way it works. And we're going to be there, and we're going to learn things about ourselves. We're going to learn why we go one way or the other. We're going to learn about other people, your roommates, your classmates. You're going to watch them grow. They're going to rub off on you. And that's what this environment is about. And then lear learn to relate to what's different. For some of you who come from small country churches and now you're in the middle of a big church that can't gather together. That's interesting, okay? You're in the middle of a dome that seats 1,500 and there's 120 of you, you know? And you're going to learn how to do it. Oh, you do it differently than what I did back home, but guess what? Different is not always bad. And sometimes in the different we see things that we can adapt and we can use later too. And the Lord wants to show us those things. And so we're going to see this. Now, God has a plan, and, and put up our next slide, and I think it's an important point. God's plan will work out differently in each of you, depending on you as a person. You guys are going to sit in the same classes next to a person. You're going to hear the same lecture, and you know what? You're going to walk away taking something different away than the person next to you. That's because you're different learning styles, you're different people, your backgrounds, and so forth. As my wife teaches in her class, some of you are going to be imaginative. You're going to hear what the teacher says and try to figure out, what do I do with this? And some of you are going to be analytic, tell me what I need to know. And some of you are going to be dynamic. I want to do something. What can I possibly accomplish with this? And that's your modality, and that is totally cool. People are different. And you come here different, and this is the amazing thing about genetics. Each of you is genetically unique. You're programmed that way. And in your cells of your body, you've got this unique genetic code, and you come here and so forth. And when you look at your life, you need to come to grips with, and so do I, your uniqueness in comparison to what other people's uniqueness is. And we have a tendency as people, because we compare everything else, we have a tendency to go into something and say, well, I'm not like that person. I could never do that. And God says, wait a minute, just a minute. Can we stop and can we look at some people in the Bible just for a minute? And let me give you some. I'm going to give you a list of siblings. These are some guys. This is our next slide. These are guys in the Bible. And what I'd like you to see is the differences between them. Even though they come from the same family, and you're going to tell they have familial DNA. 
But there's things that are different too. Cain and Abel. Do you realize that Cain has more words recorded in the Bible than Abel? And he's the bad guy? But yet Abel has the lasting testimony in Hebrews chapter 11. When you look at Jacob and Esau, how different they are. Jacob was an ordered man. He was a domestic man. He lived in the, his brother was independent and passionate and everything else. They were twins. Very different. We look at Moses and Aaron. What a pair, brothers. Moses is the writer. He writes five books. His brother doesn't write any books. He's just the talker. And how many of you come here and one of you is the student and the other one's just the socialite? Okay. That was Moses and Aaron. And Moses, even though he wrote five books, he stuttered when he speeched, when he talked. Which means what? He needed somebody who could compliment what he couldn't do in that room. God gave him a companion. Look at Peter and Andrew. Now, we always read about Peter. Do you know what? Andrew was just as much a disciple as Peter was. And he was the quiet little brother. He's the one that followed in the shadow of his big brother and so forth. But guess what? He didn't have his sins recorded in the Bible for the whole world to see either, you know? So if you're going to be out there and an extrovert, there's a warning, all right? There just is. You look at John and James. John's going to write five books of the Bible. James isn't, but he's going to become the pastor of the mother church. They're different. And God had a role for each one. In fact, if we go down, we're going to see down through history. And our next slide I'll put up here. Amazing thing we see in, in, in history is this. God oftentimes brings together very unique people that are very different, and he joins them at the hip. Down through history, and I just picked up a couple. There are books written. I think I've got a PowerPoint that's got some on here, but Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon. Now, Martin Luther was that robust, extroverted, vulgar, rude Jewish monk, or uh, German monk, and he came on and he loved his beer and he loved his theology and so forth. Philip was a skinny, sickly little guy that sat in his real room and wrote theology. So here, Luther's out there yelling at the Pope and doing all this, and Philip's down there just writing stuff out. But you know what? Philip kept Martin from dissolving. He gave Martin the theology. Martin had the gusto. He had the extroversion. Philip had the contemplativeness. And God joined these two guys together, and guess what? They started the Reformation. We would look at them and say, that's an unlikely pair. Martin needed Philip, and Philip needed Martin. We look at Steve Wozniak now and Steve Jobs. Steve Wozniak was the inventor of the PC and Stephen Jobs, Apple, and so forth. And look at the difference between them. Wozniak said, solitude is a place where creativity is birth. And yet Steve Jobs is out there. He's selling things in front of Apple conferences. Very different personalities, and guess what? They both accomplished some amazing things. Rosa Parks, a little seamstress, and Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther would go out and lead the rallies and make the statements and walk in the parades. All that Rosa Parks did is not give up her seat on a bus. And yet Martin Luther looked at her and said, she's the catalyst. All of my talking doesn't do as much as a courageous little secretary. God joins together amazing people. We can see Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt, a married couple, yet they were dynamically different. She was into social justice and he was just into public policies and so forth. I say all that to say this. You come to PBC and God is liable to yoke you up to somebody who's very different. But you know what? The two of you together will accomplish things that you could never accomplish individually. This is the plan of God. And the plan of God will go beyond yourself at this point. And so we look and we go down and we begin to look at, at this and pull up the next slide, as we will. The next slide is going to say this, that basically our cooperation with God involves knowing ourselves and how we relate to each other. One of the most cr crucial points in our journey is that we come to grips with and become settled with who we are what God has made us, what he has designed us to be, and so forth. It stops all striving. It stops comparison. It stops envy. It stops jealousy. 
What comes out of it is just a gratitude for our great God who didn't have to choose this, but he chose to. And he comes and he says, now I'd like to talk to you and I'd like you to step in, do some, some stuff here. And, and, but first of all, you need to understand yourself. Understanding yourself will let you know how you can cooperate with me. And the next slide, I think I've put up some sources for you. There's some books that, for some of you, that may struggle a little bit when you look at yourself and you come up with the idea that I am just inadequate for all this stuff that's happening. I can't face this. I think that when I look at some others that will lead chapel up here and lead worship and everything, I can never be one of those. And I think it's very important for some people to realize that all of this, the differences between us, is the genius of our Creator. He is the one who makes us unique, He makes us different and so forth, because there are strengths in some that others do not have. Not everybody has all strength. Some of the people that have the greatest strength, like Martin Luther, he's just that extrovert going out, was very insecure. And there were times that he would get depressed and everything, and that wasn't for his little runaway nun wife, Katie, propping him up and brewing beer in the basement. Martin wouldn't have made it. He needed somebody else because even though he looked to be so strong, there was a vulnerable point where he needed to know who he was and how much he needed other people. And there's a great book here, The Genius of Opposites. There's another book called Quiet. For you that are quiet, uh, and you sit in class and the teacher asks you, asks a question, and you will never answer. You've already committed, you know, before God and country. I will never ask a question in class, you know. That's about 90% of you right now, you know, thanks to millennials, all right. And so you go and you look at this, and what she says is this. Sometimes people look down on those who are quiet, but they don't understand them. Sometimes people are quiet because they're thoughtful. Some people talk without thinking. Some people think and then they talk. Okay. And we need to understand ourselves. We need to understand how we fit so that now we can begin to appreciate, rather than fight against the design of God in our life, we begin to cooperate with him. We begin to say, let me walk in, in sync with you at this point. Let's go to our next slide. Part of the plan of God for your life is going to come from input from the outside. It's input from the outside. You and I are all made up of external factors that have contributed to us. I mean, I'm, I'm made up of things from my mom and my dad. I got some things from my dad. I got some things from my mom. Then there's stuff. I wonder where it came from, you know, but you look at it. And it all comes in, and that's our DNA. That's the stuff that's been passed on to us. But then there's stuff we get from God. This is part of his calling in our life. This is part now of where he appoints us like he did with Jeremiah. This is where he comes and he begins to equip us. And, and this equipping now is such a, a vital thing because God takes who we are and he adds to it a supernatural ability that can now take what we are and make it accomplish some amazing things. He says, well, I'm just shy. Good. Then you'll have empathy for shy people. I don't want to be one that stands up in front. Neither do I. But sometimes God will put you in a place that maybe isn't your comfort zone, but he says, I'll help you with this. I'll equip you. If I call you to it, I'll help you to do that. And then finally, he's going to implant things into your life. And this comes as, as one of my famous passages, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, James chapter 1 and verse 21. James is talking to people about how they change. If you remember the beginning of James 1, he talks about rejoicing in the trials that we face and realizing that these trials do this. We come to a place where we lack nothing in our life. It's a process, though, but in the process we have to change going over. And then at the end there, in verse 21 of chapter uh, 1 of James, he says this, that you're going to come and God's going to work into your life according to his implanted word. And the word there in the Greek and everything, when you look at it, you realize what God is doing. He's taking an individual that acts the way they do because they've gotten their genetic code from their mom and dad and everything else, but then God says this, I'm going to take my word and I'm going to put it so deep in your life that it's going to act like an inborn quality that you receive from your parents. I mean, I know where I got my physical DNA. I also know where I get my spiritual DNA. 
And God is going to come down, and what he's literally going to do is he's going to divide some of those genetic chromosomes, and he's going to say, there are some principles I want to insert, and I'm going to insert them, and guess what? It's going to become part of your genome. It's going to become part of who you are. It didn't start with you, but it will be implanted in you. And that's one of the reasons that you're here at PBC. God is through class and homework and everything else. He's going to take and plant his word in your spiritual DNA. He's going to restructure it, and that will determine the kind of person you are, how you act, and so forth. And we need to understand the role that that happens. You say, well, can I go to an altar call, and can they pray for me, and can that just happen? No, if you know anything about agriculture, you plant a seed, and it takes time. And God will plant a lot of seeds in your classes, and they will grow. And before long, you'd find yourself doing things you didn't used to do, and God said, told you. See, my goal for you is that you share the divine nature, which means I've got to get the divine nature into your nature. And one of the vehicles I'll, I'll do for that is my word. Now, once we begin to know what God wants to do with our life, then our next slide says this. Our self-image now is going to be really affected by what we know. Our self-image is the compilation of, of what we think we are, our limitations, our strengths, or whatever. We have a picture of ourselves, and sometimes our picture of ourselves is, is not the same one that God has. Sometimes our picture of ourselves is very small, and God says, you don't see the potential that's there. And somewhere along the line, we have to come, and we have to allow God to show us who we are in his sight. You are accepted in the beloved. You are one of my precious kids. You are the apple of my eye. And God begins just to dawdle over his kids and say, you don't know how much I love you. And we'll see here now that we go into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that amazing chapter there about uh, gifting and so forth. And this is what Paul helps us to understand a little bit so that we can function with the sameness that we have. That, that is, there's many gifts by one spirit, there's many ministries by one Lord, and there's many extensions and so forth by one. And he goes down and he says, there's a lot of things that we share, but there's a lot of things that are different too. Understand the commonality and understand the distinctions that are there. Because if you don't, then what will happen is this. And you read it down there in the passage. You won't understand the unity and the diversity that it, both of them take place at the same time. You'll think that everything either has to all be the same or you won't understand or I'm just going to be different for different sake when I should be alike in some sense too. But what can happen so easily, and this is what chapter 12 says, if I don't understand who I am, I will either not think I fit, oh, I'm not an I, so I'm not part of the body, or I will come to the conclusion that I don't need anybody else. I don't need you. And we can come to these wrong things, and Satan will fuel that in our life. He'll fuel it and say, oh, you're more important than ever. You know things. And he says, no, you need to realize who you are and how much you are dependent upon everybody else. Otherwise, we can start saying, I don't need or I'm not worthy. And God says, no, both of those are wrong. And so he comes back, and he wants us to understand how we fit into his whole frame. And that's part of what PBC is all about. We come here and God speaks to us and he's going to let you know your differences. He's going to help you see that. But he's also going to let you know how you're a member of the family and how you fit in here so beautifully and so forth. And as we go down then, I, I want to just focus on two things. And this is where we'll kind of wrap it up today. I want to focus on two things. And these two things are constantly held in tension with each other. And one of them is your uniqueness and the other one now is going to represent your ability to change. There are certain things in your life, and go to our, our next slide there. We'll look at it. Our next slide is this. You realize that your uniqueness is a miracle. Your genetic code, and that's a, a little double helical genetic code there. And the information in you, I don't know if you realize how extensive it is. You've got 70 to 100 trillion cells in your body. Every cell has chromosomes in it, and every chromosome has a DNA code in it. To give you an idea how extensive this is, and it's not by accident, it's by design, you have a gigabyte of information stored in every single cell of your body. Now do the math. A gigabyte times 100 trillion 
That's a lot of gigabytes. It really is. But God inputs this in it because this is his miracle. This is the miracle that allows you to come out with your ability to sing. It allows you to come out with your ability to speak and communicate to groups. It allows your ability to, to touch marginalized people that nobody else will find. And it, it, it controls your physical, but it also controls a lot of your temperament and who you are. You are a miracle of uniqueness. Never look down on your uniqueness. Some people try to push, oh, I just wish I didn't have freckles or I wish I didn't have red hair or whatever. No, that's part of who you are. And what God can do with this, and I, there's a next slide we go through, one of the examples of our uniqueness, and this is just a look at the genetic code, how complex, I told you there's a gigabyte in every cell. In the nucleus of every cell are 23 chromosomes, and then there's 23 chromosomes are the double helicals, and then there's are all the genes and everything. And the information that tells how well you can process a hamburger and, and how well you can't. What enzymes your body secretes when you eat, you know, one of those things or what doesn't. It's amazing all the data that's recorded. And guess what? That data came from outside the chemicals that make up your body. Somewhere along the line, God just dumped all this information into each cell of your body and said, this is who you are. This is who you are. And I want to make sure that I let you hear my heart as a teacher. I appreciate the uniqueness of every student. I appreciate the differences that you bring. Because you all approach life and by watching the students, we get to see life differently through your eyes just a little bit. It's you that make up the beauty and the mosaic that is here. And to see what it takes to bring about that, it's an absolute miracle. I and mean, we take it for granted one of the things that we find, our next slide here, one of the things that makes us so unique is that little fingerprint. That fingerprint is unique to you. Out of all 7.2 billion people in the world, everybody's got a unique fingerprint because there's something about you that's different than everybody else. And do you know how that was formed? In your womb, in your mother's womb, as you were in there as a baby and your hands would touch the side of her womb, the pressure that was in there and how long your umbilical cord was, it created a pattern. Your fingerprint is a history of your life before you were born. And God looks at your fingerprint and says, that's who you are. That's what you went through. And the amazing thing is this, identical twins can be born. They will have identical DNA, but their fingerprints are different because each of them experiences life just a little different. And God loves that uniqueness about you. And God's going to come and say, please, don't look at your uniqueness and say, I can't make it because of this. No, God can say, you can make it with me. Uniqueness is important. But then there's another one, and there's a second miracle. And this goes along with the uniqueness. And that is this. It is that ability that God puts in us to change. Even though your genetic code is guaranteeing that you'll come out a certain way. When you look at all those little chromosomes, God designed in there the ability for you to change, depending upon the circumstances of your life. Now, we can't change everything. Jesus said this, you can't add one cubit to your height, and you can't, you know, turn one hair that's one color, another color, unless you're a girl, okay? And you do that. Some of our guys do it too. Luke, you do it too, all right? All right. So you go through, but he says, you're, there's certain things that are, that you know, you can control certain things you can't. But the ability to change is very unique. And as I was reading this, this is the part that jumped out to me. Geneticists have now determined that there are different ways, and it's a design. They re recognize it as a design. We are designed to change, and we can change in different ways. And let me show you just a little bit as we go down some of the, the ways now in which we can change. These are some of the unique things that we can do. Our next slide. Our first one is called transpositional. Transpositional is simply this. In every cell of your life, now in all your chromosomes, when a chromosome gets damaged, the chromosomes have in them the ability to rewrite correct code to fix the damage. 
Because if it didn't, then it would always pass on. Every time a cell splits, it would pass the defect on. But your cells in them have the ability to take something that's broken in certain situations, something that's damaged, and it allows it to rearrange it. Now, it doesn't create new code. It reestablishes good code that was there before. And the cell does this to itself. Some of you are going to go through PBC and you're going to see some changes and I'll tell you how they come about. Through your changes in your personal disciplines, managing your time, getting with God every day, there are things that you do and guess what's going to happen? Some damaged DNA is going to get fixed. Some damaged areas of our life because why? We have some input into this area. That's only one way. This doesn't change everything and there's only a certain percentage of your chromosomes that can change, but the next one is really fun. It's called horizontal gene transfer. This is a miracle of nature where two cells can come together and they can bump each other and while they bump, they swap information. This is cool. It's like R2-D2 plugging into the Death Star, you know, and he's sitting there and he's doing a read down on the entire computer system on that and so forth, and he walks away. You're doing that all the time. You're doing it right now. Anytime a strange body comes, bacteria comes in your body, your white blood cells will go up. And what do they do? They'll bump into this new foreign, and what do they, they download the DNA, and then they head off to the lymph system, and what do they do? Create an antibody. You're doing that all the time, and so do you. Your roommate, boom. <laughs> People in classes, boom. The private time you spend with a teacher, boom. And it's those divine connections that do what? They take information that didn't used to be yours, but it shares it with you. Do you know what this is called in genetics? This is called community DNA. It's where a group of cells together began to share and cooperate with each other. And it's through the connections of life that new stuff comes to us. But the last one we'll go through, and this one is really fun. This is called symbiogenesis. Now, this is a funny little thing. This is where cells will change and the DNA will change because two separate organisms come together and one of them will eat the other one. Yeah. Okay, we'll eat the other one, but it doesn't destroy it. The genetic code of the one that's been eaten goes in and it joins with the genetic code of the host, and now it changes the whole genetic code of the host creature. Some of the plants that are around there do this. They used to be two separate plants, but then they merge, and their strengths came together. One of the classic examples of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll spiritualize it for you, that you had a, a, a protozoa that was down here and it came into a bacterium that had a chloroplast, which is the ability to convert sunlight through chlorophyll into energy. The original protozoa did not have that, but the original, it ate up and before long, this little guy was inside and suddenly the protozoa had the ability to convert sunlight into energy when it didn't have it, but it has it because something's living inside of it that was separate and distinct from it, but now it's part of it. I hope you caught the analogy. The Holy Spirit has now come and he lives in you. When you were born, you were a child of darkness. You didn't know what to do with light. But he was created in the presence of light. When the Holy Spirit comes down and moves in your life, guess what he's going to do? He's going to give you the ability to process light and turn it into energy. Why? Because the glory of God living within you as we wrap this up, and this is my word to you, don't fear the future because God has put you in a unique place because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Please don't let all that's happening in the streets blind you to the miracle that lives within. God has designed you with your strengths and so forth, and he's also designed you to be able to change. I say, Lord, how can we handle the future? And he says, I'll give you four ways. Spend time in my word. Spend time developing your personal disciplines in your life. Spend time hanging out with people who build you up and encourage you. 
and give time to the Holy Spirit to bring abilities into your life that you never had before. I can guarantee you that if you do these, you're going to find that you're not just going to survive, you're going to overcome. And this is it. And this is my word to you, PBC. Hard days are here, but our God is strong. And our God's going to help you through this. And I want to encourage you, hang in there. Stay close to people. Stay close to God. And you say, well, I'm waiting for the drastic change. It happens one cell at a time. Until they all begin to share that same code. And before long, everything starts working together as a unit. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you. We know that you brought us here. We know that the miracle, the miracle of sustaining us and, and just giving us wisdom to handle all the things that are out there and, and the encouragement of each other, our prayer meetings where we're praying for each other and sharing our needs with each other. This phase, PBC, is an important point in our journey. And it's here that we learn to understand ourselves and we un understand each other and we learn to understand how you can change us. And Lord, we acknowledge, just like Psalms 139 said, Lord, search me, examine me, try me. Look in my life, look at all those parts that you know so well and figure out what you need to do with them all. So that truly, like Romans 8 says, we can be more than conquerors through him who loved us. Help us all in these desperate days. We pray. Thank you.